Welcome to Comic Con at Home. This is graphic novel or illustrated book. You make the call. And this is the third year that we've done this. This is the first year we've done it uh, in this virtual format. And uh, we'll start with Karen. Oh, I knew you'd start with me. Now I have to figure out what to say. Um, my name's Karen Green. I'm the curator for comics and cartoons at Columbia University. Perfect. Rick? I'm Rick Veach. Uh, I've been a cartoonist my whole life. Armand? I'm Armand Baltazar. I am an artist and an author. Mark? I'm Mark Wheatley, and I'm a artist and author and anything that needs to be done on a book. <laughs> One of the great topics that we've had uh, in this panel the last couple of editions has been how these art forms are hard to distinguish at some times and easy to distinguish at others. Uh, each of our panelists will walk you through some examples that they have uh, of the evolution of this work and the evolution of their thought on it. And I think, again, we should start with you, Karen. Okay. Um, first up is a page from uh, Rodolphe Topfer's uh, L'Histoire de Monsieur de Dubois, uh, translated into English as The Adventures of Obadiah Oldbuck. Um, it was first published in 1837. And while Topfer is often referred to as the father of the graphic novel, it doesn't necessarily look like what people expect a graphic novel to look like. It's a uh, picture with caption underneath, um, more like the sort of uh, imagerie d'épinal poster-like things that you used to see in the, in the 19th century, where you'd see an image with a caption underneath it. Uh, but he's been grandfathered in and hailed as, as the father, so let's take it. If you're looking at telling a narrative visually, this is what he's doing, but it doesn't necessarily look the way people think in their minds comics are going to look. Uh, my next page is from uh, Granville's Un Autre Monde. I, I always like to include this one because of a, a talk I once went to by a, a Hunter College professor named Patricia Minardi about this transitional moment in the early uh, early to mid 19th century between kind of the standard illustrated novel and what would evolve into the, the graphic novel. And Granby is, is heavily, heavily, heavily illustrated, but it's still kind of spot illos or full page illos in embedded in text. But it is kind of this transitional thing. It was published in 1844. Then I, I go forward to the other godfather of the graphic novel, or the second godfather of the graphic novel, Lind Ward. Um, and these are a few pages from God Man, which is a, a wordless graphic novel. So this is almost the kind of the opposite of our question. This is nothing but visuals. Uh, but does that absence of dialogue of captions take it into some other other category is it is it an illustrated book rather than a, a graphic novel that was 1929 a year later uh, Rockwell Kent did his illustrated Moby Dick and I put that up there because I've heard more than one person say that if you removed all of the Rockwell Kent drawings from Moby Dick and just put those in a book, you could actually read it as if it were a wordless graphic novel. He, he captures those, those beats and moments so perfectly uh, that it does have a narrative. Now we're gonna jump forward again uh, to the 21st century to Rene French's The Soap Lady. And again, this is a little bit like, um, like Topfer. It is a page of illustration, caption underneath it, not even handwritten the way Topfer is. Uh, so could look like a children's book, but I don't know, Library of Congress catalogs it as a graphic novel. So what are they That's why we're having this talk, isn't it? Exactly. Yes, we're doing it for the benefit of the catalogers of the library. <laughs> <laughs> Listen up. 
Then uh, next from 2007 is Brian Talbot's Alice in Sunderland, which is just a, I don't know what you'd call it. It's, it's a pastiche. It's an excuse for you to work Alice in Wonderland into this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Rick, you might not know, but I have a, a, a certain passion for Alice in Wonderland. And one day when we meet, you will draw in my sketchbook. Just oh. you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So yes, Alice in Sunderland is uh, photographs, drawings, photo manipulation, captions, text, speech balloons, all kind of crammed together into this magical, it's one of my favorite books on earth. I, I just think it's, it's so brilliant. Um, but, and it's, it's narrative is, I don't want to say fractured because that sounds like an insult, but there is a sort of disjointed nature to the narrative as it kind of takes you through literary and political history, showing Lewis Carroll's presence throughout. Again, I'm not entirely sure where it falls in this decision process. 2011, Lauren Redness, MacArthur Genius Award winner, uh, her book Radioactive. Um, much like Tupper, we're back to uh, hand lettering. Um, but it's a text heavy page and an illustration light page, but it has that feel of comics, but is it comics? Comics, such a hard thing to define. This next one, uh, 2017, Robert Hunter's Map of Days, just a gorgeous book. Um, but what you see is uh, panels with images alternating with panels with only text. Uh, so it looks like a comic. It's got the panel grid and gutters, but the images and the text don't necessarily meet and interact with each other. They are juxtaposed to each other. Next, uh, Greg Manchus's uh, Above the Timberline, which comes closest, I think, to the sort of work we'll see from Mark and Armand. Uh, just heavily beautiful, painterly, illustration with, uh, in, in this case, a fairly meager amount of text. It could be thought of as an illustrated book, but I feel happy claiming it as a, as a graphic novel. It, it gives you that visual storytelling. Um, the next year, 2018, Nora Krug's book, Belonging, which came out uh, in German as Heimat. Um, much like Lauren Redness, also lots of hand lettering much more heavily illustrated. It won the Lind Ward Prize for Best Graphic Novel from Penn State's Center for the Book. So clearly it's seen as a graphic novel. Once again, it's cataloged as a graphic novel. Um, and I'm happy to accept it as a graphic novel, but it doesn't necessarily look like people's preconceptions of a graphic novel. And then my final photo um, is actually from a uh, an online essay at longreads.com by Carolita Johnson, who's a New Yorker cartoonist. Uh, she did a six part series called A Woman's Work and she calls these illustrated essays. Um, she doesn't do long form comics. She does single panel cartoons and these are heavily illustrated, but there's speech balloons in them. So in a way it kind of falls into that um, wimpy kid weird category where nobody's quite sure <laughs> what that is either. Um, do you, Karen, do you see any unifying characteristics of the examples that you chose or did you choose them to show how far out the boundaries of our discussion are? I think the latter. Um, I think I chose mine not because I see a unifying thing because they are going in, in lots of different directions. Um, but they can all find themselves harboring under this one umbrella, uh, depending on how you look at them. Sure, and, and since you've studied the history of this extensively, would you, would you say that the evolution of it is a straight line or a big zigzag graph? Oh, I don't think there are straight lines in anything. <laughs> I think people like to impose straight lines because that fits uh, a comforting narrative. People like linear narratives, but nothing, 
nothing is a linear narrative. There's all sorts of zigs and zags throughout history, throughout the development of the arts, everything. Very good. Uh, Rick, would you walk us through your choices? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not really into defining like what's a graphic novel and what isn't. I'm a practicing artist who's always been looking for new and interesting ways to make comics. Um, you know, I've drawn a bazillion regular comic book pages with many panels. Um, but in the last couple of years, I've gotten into this thing that I call panel vision, which is one panel per page and to tell a story that way. And this was inspired by a number of different things. Uh, I think my first slide is Monroe by uh, Jules Pfeiffer. And this was a book that we had in my house when I was a kid. You know, it is a graphic novel. There wasn't a word for it, I guess, in those days. But Pfeiffer, I think, did a number of books like that that were like either one or two illustrations on a page or even one. And the book itself is like a little mind bomb. It's complete. There's never going to be Monroe number two. There's never going to be another thing. It's, it, it's meant to give the reader a singular experience. And I always was attracted to that feeling. When I went to Luca in 1981, they had copies of The Black Cat by Jodorowsky and Mobius. This wasn't available in the States in those days. Um, but it was an extraordinary book because, again, it existed as a complete thought, a complete creative experience. Um, what was really cool about it, too, was that they didn't sell them. They, they, didn't, they gave them away. It was like a thing that humanoids did to give to people. Um, I think they printed like 2,000 copies and handed them out. And, of course, it immediately went you know, sky high. I couldn't buy a copy when I was there, even though I tried really hard. While I was there, though, they had released a second Moebius one-shot. And this is another one, a, a little, uh, I'm not sure the pronunciation there. Maybe Karen can help me. Can you see that? I can't see it. T-U-E-U-R, De Monde. Oh, the death of the world. T -t -t <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a tough, it's a tough one for the non-French speaker. It's like, t -t 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 -t. And this was another gift that they, another gift that they created and gave away. And I was able to get a copy of this. And you can see, like both with the eyes of the cat and with this one, they were trying to do different printing techniques. Like, and this one's all printed in blue. And the eyes of the cat was printed on yellow paper to give it some sort of extraordinary. So I was always taken by uh, those two Moebius books. And um, all during my career, I was like trying to talk editors into allowing me to do books one panel per page because I felt that the reading experience was a lot different than anything you got reading a regular comic book. The fact that you had one image per page force, forces the reader or allows the reader just to spend more time on that illustration and to sort of feel their way into it and to bring a piece of themselves into it as well, I think, if it's done right, especially a book like Eyes of the Cat which there's no real meaning given to you. You know, you have to bring yourself to it to fulfill its meaning. And, and that's an extraordinary way to make art, I, I think. The rest of my slides are my own books, which when I finally was able to figure out how to do it and to publish books with single panels. There we go. <laughs> this was my first one I, I did. It's called Super Catchy. And again, it says one panel per page. And it kind of takes you on this sort of metaphysical journey, kind of strange thing. The uh, second one was Spotted Stone, which I don't have a copy of, but was actually was nominated for an Eisner somehow, because this is like a, you know, a tiny print run. You know, if, if there were four or 500 of these sold, I mean, that's a lot. And then Otzi, here's another one. So a single panel, panel per page. And it allowed me, in the case of Otzi, to experiment with moving the reader from chaotic illustrations to order, where all of a sudden the rocks the guy's battling on form some sort of order. And as you follow through in the book, the, the order becomes more and more concise, and it pushes a story along. So these are the, th these are the kind of things that make me excited 
uh, that I can find a new way of doing comics. I've got so many ideas for this now that uh, I, I know I'm just going to probably be pumping these things out for the rest of my days. We should all be so lucky. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Do you find that you're drifting toward the single panel? Did that Was that a revelation to you that happened suddenly, or was it something you just sort of worked through your process and got there, and then once it, once it took, it really took? No, it was something inspired by the two Moebius books. Um, you know, owning, owning them and being able to read them, I realized that it was a different reading experience than um, I got reading my regular copy of, you know, The New Gods or something, which is great. Um, and so I was always hoping to bring that into my work. Like, how can I do this? How can I do this? Um, it didn't make sense in terms of publishing because you need a lot of pages to tell a graphic novel with one panel per page. Um, and it was the Kindle and create space model, which is the way they price per page units. Uh, it's easy to do a 150 page book. It's cheap to do a 150 page book. So you can have like 150 panels, which is really like a 20 page story of a comic book. So uh, again, you know, my connection here is creative. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential in this uh, format, at least for me. Well, that's, those are great examples. Armand, let's go. Let's go with you, since we'll go from one creator to another here. Right. And 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 you've we you've been on this panel for the, the its its lifespan so far, <laughs> and and you're one of the prime practitioners of this blended thing of what is a graphic novel or illustrated story. Right. And you know what I don't remember asking you previously was what compelled you to the form you finally chose. Well. Um... That's a really good question. And, um, you know, I'm going to uh, actually jump ahead in my slides to slide number six. So it's a little out of order, but given what we're talking about, I think this sort of works out perfectly. So my slide number six is uh, a depiction of uh, one of the just uh, iconic illustrations by Maurice Sendak with, um, you know, the little boy Max, and he is being greeted by the big sort of most of, uh, lovable of the wild things on the island. And I remember when I read that story as a kid, uh, I was moved not just by the powerful art, but with the, um, the, simplest, the simple and direct words that accompanied each image. And the thing that happened was that uh, what I found was uh, the words were evocative. The images were evocative. Like the images completed what the words hinted at and uh, the words hinted at something more that was deeper than what the image was. It was kind of like together fused, it left a little bit of mystery. So they complemented each other. And then as I got older, like, like many folks, I, I fell in love with uh, traditionally illustrated novels, in my case as a boy, adventure novels like Robin Hood and Treasure Island and you know, the works of N.C. Wyatt. And I was like, wow, this is fantastic. But then at the same time, I was also a little boy that loved Spider-Man, you know, and Thor and, and loved comics. And the thing is, is I, what, what affected me as a young person was that the story and the visuals living, you know, in my imagination and they could coexist. And what I found that when I wanted to write uh, a book, when I had the desire to create a book, I had more to say in words and I had more to say uh, in pictures than for example, could be conveyed in a 30-page comic book or a 40-page graphic novel. I wanted to be able to go inside the heads of characters. I wanted to be able to um, to do things that were limiting in uh, in the comic pages. But on the same token, I didn't want to just write a story that um, was a whole bunch of words with uh, you know, a big spread or a half-page illustration, you know, uh, every chapter. And so I ended up having this desire to tell the story in a way that um, kind of blended the best of both worlds. So I'm, I'm uh, calling up a slide. This is the cover of my book. And one of the things that you'll see in the book uh, is that it's, it's, a, it's a novel format. Okay. And I remember when I read James Gurney's Dinotopia, I was like, oh my gosh, that's what I want to do. I want to do this big picture book format. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, publisher looked at my manuscript and said, you've got a, over 100,000 words of story. Uh, that's going to be the most expensive wide format picture book ever, you know, with that amount of writing. 
we can't do that. That's, uh, you know, you're not James Gurney. So, <laughs> you know, we, we don't know if this book will, anyone will want it, but they may want a book this size. They may want a book with all your words and, you know, uh, all these images in there. And um, a part of my ridiculous drive to make a book with all these images came out of working in animation for 20 years. I was used to pictorial storytelling with a lot of images. And what I found is I had to find a way to pare down what I wanted uh, with what told the story like the most effective way. So I'm pulling up slide two now. This is uh, like what a typical page looks like in my book. It's uh, one page of text, uh, another page uh, showcasing uh, Diego about to jump onto his gravity board, or um, and then you'd flip the page and then you would get a full spread of Diego flying through the city, much like as if you were reading uh, Treasure Island with a full spread of, uh, of N.C. Wyatt. Uh, and then the next page, or my next slide that I've got up, it is uh, Diego and this girl Lucy, and you can actually see some text, but I put this in my slides because you're seeing an editorial note here, and it's in the editorial note it says, add copy. And one of the things I want to talk about this time around that I haven't in past discussions is that when you write a novel and then you're going to put in tons of illustrations, um, you have to sort of figure out where the images are going to go to coordinate with the words. But on the same token, like a, like a great comic book page, if you've got an emotional, like, you know, kind of exploding scene, you know, to happen, you want it to be when the page turns. So you have to design when those happen. And it becomes an even more difficult task when you have a ton of words, you know, as opposed to just going from panel to panel. I mean, none of it's ever easy, but I found like, oh my gosh, I had the complications of how hard it was to write a novel with just traditional illustration and then want to have um, the storytelling uh, capabilities of, uh, you know, the comic. And so the next slide just is the follow-up and it shows the two characters dealing with dinosaurs. And then it, it is uh, finishing off with another slide of Diego and the dinosaurs and text above. So it was this thing of, uh, from an early age of trying to figure out how to put stories and um, images together that I couldn't, I couldn't decide one or the other. I had to have the best of both worlds. And so that's how I ended up uh, <laughs> going down the path to make uh, the book that I made in the way that I made it. That's a good blurb for your book. The best of both worlds. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. I think that that's a, a, a pretty great description of how you, how you got to the process. I know that we're in working on comics or graphic novels, uh, I'm deliberate about trying to have some important reveals be on the left-hand page. Uh, we, naturally go, we naturally go to the right-hand page, as, you know, the way most people's brains work, and people a lot of comic book artists tend to put big splashes on that. Uh, I'm trying to reward the person who's actually reading and not just skimming, not just skimming through it. So right. I tend, I tend to bury some important details on left pages. So that's sort of what you were talking about, about that editorial note of, you know, add copy there because you want the, you want the, the, you want the visuals to flow a certain way, just as you want the text to flow a certain way. Um, do you want to talk about it, uh, some of your other slides specifically or, uh, do you want to talk about any great examples that you know of other people doing this? Well, yeah, actually I have some, some other slides that I sort of wanted to show you guys. Uh, the first of the optional slides shows an entire chapter that was laid out. Uh, and so there are something like four, five, six, uh, like 24 images on here. And when I was creating the artwork in a chapter, I would sort of think about the story and I'd start to create uh, the kind of visual moments. And then I found out that uh, sometimes the visual storytelling wasn't the right kind of storytelling. And I needed to just uh, kill that image and go back to the text because I know I knew that we needed to be inside the character's head, you know, and, and so the process was shaping the other, you know, it'd be going back and forth. And um, the next slide after that is kind of an action scene that happens where if you're reading the text, uh, the characters are on this boat and they're being attacked and there's a lot happening um, inside the character's, you know, head, the main character's head and emotions. And I wanted to follow that up with a sequence of events that had no words whatsoever, but would only be sequential panels of visual storytelling. And so to get that to 
to work out right meant rewriting that chapter over and over and over so it could get it to fit like but still have like the right emotional kind of rhythm and so i test this out on my 12 year old son and go what do you think he's like ah this is confusing dad i'm like "Ooh, i gotta redo it again was it the art or the words yes and like okay i gotta redo both <laughs> you know and so uh the thing is is when i would look at the best illustrators you know we've talked about nc wyeth before they had this ability he had this ability specifically to pick moments in between words to pick scenes in between what was being described in the action and um i use that sort of as a as like the holy grail to sort of try to approach things and then um i try to balance it out against the other part of me which is cinematic and there are moments of where i want to, to when you're looking at the pictures go oh my gosh i feel like i'm in a movie you know, and actually- You are right now. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so it's, uh, but it's, it's, it's a balance. I guess if I, if I want to call out two people that I look at storytelling that were big influences and in what I try to do, I'm going to say like uh, Steven Spielberg, the Norman Rockwell, grouping them as one, and then the sort of N.C. Wyatt kind of evocative, kind of powerful uh, image making as the other- end of the spectrum that my head bounces between as I'm trying to figure out how to plot visuals for a story. That's a really, that's a really powerful analogy. That's very good. Mark, you want to uh, walk us through the images you've selected? Well, I think Armand just uh, did it for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was starting with uh, N.C. Wyeth, a uh, fairly unknown artist that no one's mentioned so far. Um, yeah. Uh, NC actually made a point of talking about how he would like to illustrate things that were not specifically described in the book, but enrich the reader's experience. And for me, and, and you know, for all we know, he could have gotten that from Pyle, Howard Pyle, his teacher. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, that defines an illustrated book. If you're, if you're illustrating a book, you, you don't want people to be able to flip through the book and get all the spoilers and say, all right, I don't need to read the book and toss it, right? You want, you want to lure them into the book, to learn more about what these intriguing pictures are hinting at or suggesting. And uh, my first slide is from Treasure Island, and it's all about the moment that a shot is about to be fired. And you create that tension between the action that's described in the book and what's actually been painted. So until you read it, you can't pull those triggers on the guns. So uh, in my own work, when I'm illustrating a comic, it's the exact opposite. I want to show the story. I want to tell the story with visuals that lead us through. I don't want a caption to have to explain what's going on. I want the picture to show you what's going on. So in a way, it's an exact opposite tension. But what is the same between an illustrated book and a graphic novel, I believe, is that wonderful tension that you get between words and pictures. If you have one without the other, I think they can still be defined as a comic or an illustrated book. You go back to Rockwell Kent, for example. But when you're really firing on all cylinders, it's a tension between the words and the picture. And the, the words are great for getting inside the, the emotions of the characters, like Armand was saying. Uh, and the pictures are great for establishing mood and scene and character. And, and that cinematic, epic sweep you can create. And, and Armand's done so well. The thing that I find fascinating about all of this is that you could, don't have to make the choice. So Dr. Cthulhu is uh, my experiment on this, which has pages that are nothing but an illustration to illustrate text. But it's also got pages, as Armand was mentioning, that have panels. And so you can actually follow the action and there's something that occurs between the panels and your brain fills it in the same way it would in a comic. So there's more of a uh, sliding line in, in that. So there's a couple pages that are a graphic novel and there are a couple pages that are an illustrated book. <laughs> and I, I'll be killed by every librarian I know at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, We're doubly appreciated, Mark. Doubly uh, appreciated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can only hope. Um, so, and and like Rick, I, I really enjoy 
exploring different aspects of how you can use pictures and words to communicate ideas, concepts, and stories. What do you think is the natural outgrowth of what you have been doing on Dr. Cthulhu Little, or you, you're uh, adapting the, the uh, pulp poets, uh, which you've done fairly recently. Uh, what do you think the natural outgrowth of that is in, in its physical form? I don't know what the natural one is, but I think the next step is if we're actually going to try to turn images and words into moving pictures. <laughs> wow. Uh, Jeff and I are actually developing a, a documentary using um, pictures and words to uh, communicate the ideas, much in the same way Ken Burns would tell a story using existing artifacts from history. So, Only it's the history of the future. That's getting away from print entirely. But you know, Rick, you know, the thing you've done in Super Catchy that I thought was fascinating was your, your whole idea of a single panel per page. Because I think that empowers the reader to an extent because they tell their story to themselves as they turn the page. And it's the same way you read a book, you know, you, you, you're in control. And the moment you do something like what I'm talking about doing with Jeff, turning it into video, you remove the control and you turn the reader or the viewer into a passive participant. Where before, with a book, they were an active participant. Uh, when we originally did Return of the Human uh, for an online comic, we didn't want it to be motion comics. We didn't want to turn the reader into a passive participant. So we made each frame something that was there for the reader to experience. And when they were done, they had to click to move forward in the story. And when we were theorizing how we would do this, we were thinking, well, we'll try this. But when we actually had enough pages together and we clicked through it, the power of just simply having a static illustration with a caption, and the only thing that changes is the caption box, it suddenly hits you with an emotional response and you realize you're getting a very similar experience in print. So, I mean, that's really interesting. Well, that fits what we're talking about here, but it's definitely what you're doing with Super Catchy in your book. That's a really interesting take on it. Yeah, I think it, we're, we're both working on the same side of the street in some sense. Here we I are. Think, <laughs> <laughs> I think we have to, uh, or at least I have to sort of speak of the influence of Roy Lichtenstein. Because Lichtenstein, you know, yes, he swiped all these panels and we <laughs> despise him for that. But he understood the power of the panel. You know, he hung up a panel on a wall. And you go, you look at that panel, you know it's comics because of it stylistically. You think of what, what happened to those characters leading up to that moment that you're looking at and what happens afterwards. It's like you're, you can almost create a whole backstory for this one panel you're seeing. And I think... For me, that's one of the keys of is trying to get people to bring their own imagination to a work of art, to, right. to fill in the blanks so it becomes really personalized. So like you might read The Eyes of the Cat and see one thing, and I might read it and see a completely different thing because it draws that out of us, that, that deeper unconscious. That's what I'm shooting for. I've always said that art happens in two places. The experience we as creators have is that we're in the moment creating the art and it's a wonderful interactive experience and you know who cares whoever reads this right <laughs> we're involved we're doing it right we're, we're doing it and we have a lot of payoff for that emotionally and creatively but then we end up with an artifact all of this artifacts go out into the world and people each pick them up and look at them and each of them have an entirely different response and experience to it because They've led different lives and they've had different experiences. You know, there's a, a point that you made just now, Rick, about um, kind of diving into this panel, exploring this panel, and each person creating their own story, which reminds me of the, the psychological test that yeah. is given often to, to children, I think. Um, I don't know, maybe adults as well, where you're handed a single image and are asked to tell that story. And the story that you tell will be a reflection of who you are, not so much what the image is. And that's part of that, 
that interactive nature really of of image and and viewer or reader where each half of the equation is is creating something new and something unique yes i, I think you're talking about a rorschach test um no they're not uh they're not blots. They're actually like, it'll be like a, a family eating dinner around the table. Mm. And, and you have to, and then you have to tell a story about, you know, what's going on here. Right. And you re reveal your character to the therapist as you're doing that. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I like find serial killers, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I think is interesting too, you know, Karen, when you're going through your slides in, that the way that sort of um, a storytelling with visuals, you know, sort of integrated, evolved in time, right? And it evolved due to what was happening in society, what was happening in history, what was happening in the world. I think that things like, uh, like what Rick is doing, like what Mark is doing, like what I'm trying to do is kind of a response to sort of, um, all that's come before, right, in terms of what's been done with comics, what's done with illustrated novels, and then also living in a world con concurrently where everything is being bombarded at you at the same sort of time. I remember having uh, an interview where someone said, you know, your artwork sometimes is reminiscent of stuff that you see in video games. Is that because you need to appeal to short attention span kids? And I'm like... <laughs> I kind of never thought about it that way as ter in terms of a, like a gimmick or something like that, you know, to secure attention. I mean, it wasn't, it hadn't been the intention, but the thing is, is that we can't help but be influenced by the things that are constantly around us visually and what other artists are constantly doing and pushing the sort of envelope. So it's actually not surprising when um, that happens and it sort of reinvents itself. Like Rick, looking at some of your images, I'm, thought of another Wyeth. Yeah, I thought of, um, you know, uh, NC's uh, son, right? Andrew Wyeth. And my God, the power of a single image he could craft could become so evocative. And it could, doesn't even have to be something that's even very narrative, but you would have to bring the narrative to it. And I think that these stories and these comics and the visuals we're doing are constantly challenging people to want to bring who they are and the time that they live in, you know, their own set of values in it, right? So my kid's gonna read, read my book and he's not going to see NC Wyeth, he's gonna see something else. Maybe he'll see Indiana Jones for his time or it will be a Fortnite character from a video game, I don't know. But you know, the thing is, is that um, that's kind of the cool power of what we're doing too and putting it out there like you say mark we put it out there and generation after generation will come to it a little bit differently and hopefully find their value for themselves in it you know mm -hmm. don't, don't you get that from your fans when they come and talk to you and they tell you how much they love this certain aspect of a story and i'm sitting there going i i <laughs> in there did what was that in there <laughs> right i would going to respond to Armand about the, the visceral nature of the way we relate to images as opposed to the way we relate to text. It's, a, it's an immediate response and that could contribute to that moment of this is, this is the page where you know Cthulhu came out of the water. Uh, this is the page where um, the east wind opens the, the ground and the the horrible per I grew up on Arthur Schick's uh, Anderson's fairy tales. <laughs> and all of those they're just burned, you know, the demons holding the mirror that cracks uh, in the mm. snow. You know, these are just, they're visceral because that's how you respond to images. That's, you know, and that goes back to Lascaux. Well, thank you for watching our virtual panel. And uh, I think we'll go through each of our panelists and find out what they've got going. I'd like to urge you to check out the Overstreet Comic Book Price Guide number 50, our 50th anniversary edition, which will be out, it appears, September 2nd. Karen. Oh, gosh. Well, my library is closed right now. It's been closed since March 17th, and we have no idea when it's going to reopen. Uh, and it will be, whenever that date is, it will be several 
months afterward that we welcome the public back in. But when the public does come back, um, I can tell them that the project I've been working on during my remote working life these last three months is going through our mini comics collection and doing an inventory that then feeds into our catalogers who are creating catalog records. I've inventoried about 14 or 1500 so far um, and probably have another couple thousand to go. Uh, and you know, now that I think about it for the terms of this panel, it's, you know, a lot of these mini comics are just little image per page, little pop of, of narrative visual. Uh, so they, they do kind of fit with that. Um, so people should come see them when we reopen. Excellent. Rick? Um, I'm still cranking out comics. Um, if anyone's interested in seeing some of the books that we've been discussing here, like Otzi and Redemption and Super Catchy, uh, you just have to go to Amazon. They're, they're all available there. Um, and uh, a brand new issue of Rarebit Fiends will be released today. Oh, Number nice. 24. Nice. Mark? Well, um, fortunately, I decided to take the year off from publishing except for the 30th anniversary of Breathtaker, which was supposed to premiere at the San Diego Comic-Con. And what we're doing is next year is officially the 30th anniversary of Breathtaker, and it's going to premiere next year at San Diego. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> So, uh, so yes, there's that, and uh, also we're I'm still doc working on new Doctor Cthulhu uh, projects, and uh, you can find Doctor Cthulhu at drcthulhu.com. That's it. I keep doing stuff. <laughs> All right, Armand, wrap us up here. <clears throat> well, um, I um, I am writing the second and illustrating the second timeless uh, book. But if you would like to see or buy a copy of Timeless Diego and Rangers of the Vast Atlantic, you can find it at uh, timelessarmandbaltazar.com or you can find it on Amazon. Or the last thing, which I'd really like to promote, is find your local bookstore uh, because they need your patronage, especially in times like this. And you can find my book and other people's great books like Mark's, Rick's and all kinds of great stuff. A good place, incidentally, to support your local bookshops during this pandemic is through bookshop.org. You can buy things from that site and proceeds go to your local bookshop. But support these local bookstores and um, thank you for watching us. <laughs> <laughs>